Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. Section 6. Excerpts of Akkadian, Babylonian and Assyrian Literature. Translated by Crawford H. Toy. 1. Theogony. In the time when above the heaven was not named, the earth beneath bore no name, when the ocean the primeval parent of both, the abyss Tiamat, the mother of both, the waters of both mingled in one. No fields as yet were tilled, no moors to be seen, when as yet of the gods not one had been produced, no names they bore, no titles they had, then were born of the gods. Lakmu Lakamu came into existence. Many ages passed. Anshar Kishar were born. Many days went by. Anu. Here there is a long lacuna. The lost lines completed the history of the creation of the gods, and gave the reason for the uprising of Tiamat with her hosts. What it was that divided the divine society into two hostile camps can only be conjectured. Probably Tiamat, who represents the unfriendly or chaotic forces of nature, saw that her domain was being encroached on by the light gods, who stand for cosmic order. 2. Revolt of Tiamat To her came flocking all the gods. They gathered together, they came to Tiamat. Angry they plan, restless by night and by day. Prepare for war with gestures of rage and hate, with combined might to begin the battle. The mother of the abyss, she who created them all, unconquerable warriors, gave them giant snakes, sharp of tooth, pitiless in might. With poison like blood she filled their bodies. Huge poisonous adders raging, she clothed them with dread, filled them with splendour. He who sees them shuddering shall seize him, they rear their bodies, none can resist their breast. Vipers she made, terrible snakes, raging dogs, scorpion men, fish men, bearing invincible arms, fearless in the fight. Stern are her commands, not to be resisted. Of all the first-born gods, because he gave her help, she raised up Kingu in the midst, she made him the greatest, to march in front of the host, to lead the whole, to begin the war of arms, to advance the attack, forward in the fight to be the triumpher. This she gave into his hand, made him sit on the throne. By my command I make thee great in the circle of the gods. Rule over all the gods I have given to thee. The greatest shalt thou be, thou my chosen consort. Be thy name made great over all the earth. She gave him the tablets of fate, laid them on his breast, Thy command be not gainsaid, thy word stand fast. Thus lifted up on high, endued with the news rank, among the gods her children Kingu did bear rule. The gods, dismayed, first appeal to Anu for aid against Tiamat, but he refuses to lead the attack. Anshar then sends to invite the gods to a feast. Anshar opened his mouth. To Gaga his servant spake he, Go, O Gaga, my servant, thou who delightest my soul, to Lakmu Lakamu I will send thee, that the gods may sit at the feast, bread to eat, wine to drink, to give the rule to Marduk. Up, Gaga, go to them, and tell what I say to thee. Anshar, your son, has sent me, told me the desire of his heart. He repeats the preceding description of Tiamat's preparations, and announces that Marduk has agreed to face the foe. I sent Anu. Naught can he against her. Nudimud was afraid and turned cowering back. Marduk accepted the task, the ruler of gods, your son. Against Tiamat to march his heart impels him. So speaks he to me. If I succeed, I, your avenger, Conquer Tiamat and save your lives. Come ye all and declare me supreme. In upsunken Naku enter ye joyfully all. With my mouth will I bear rule. Unchangeable be whate'er I do. 
the word of my lips be never reversed or gainsaid. Come unto him, give over the rule, that he may go and meet the evil foe. Gargar went, strode on his way, humbly before Lakmu and Lakamu, the gods his fathers. He paid his homage and kissed the ground, bent lowly down and to them spake. Anshar, your son, has sent me, told me the desire of his heart. Gaga then repeats Anshar's message at length, and the narrative proceeds. Lakmu and Lakamu heard and were afraid. The Igigi all lamented sore. What change has come about that she thus hates us? We cannot understand this deed of Tiamat. With hurry and haste they went, the great gods, all the dealers of fate, with eager tongue sat themselves down to the feast. Bread they ate, wine they drank, the sweet wine entered their souls, they drank their fill, full were their bodies. In this happy state they were ready to accept Marduk's conditions. To Marduk, their avenger, they gave over the rule. They lifted him up on a lofty throne. Above his fathers he took his place as judge. Most honoured be thou among the great gods. Unequalled thy rule, thy word is anew. From this time forth thy command be not gainsaid, to lift up and cast down be the work of thy hand. The speech of thy mouth stand fast, thy word be irresistible. None of the gods shall intrude on thy domain. Fullness of wealth, the desire of the temples of the gods, be the portion of thy shrine, though they be in need. Marduk, thou, our avenger, thine be the kingdom over all for ever. Sit thee down in might, noble be thy word. Thy arms shall never yield, the foes they shall crush. O Lord, he who trusts in thee, him grant thou life. But the deity who set evil on foot, her life pour out. Then in the midst they placed a garment. To Marduk, their firstborn, thus spake they. Thy rule, O Lord, be chief among the gods. To destroy and to create, speak and let it be. Open thy mouth, let the garment vanish. Utter again thy command, let the garment appear. He spake with his mouth, vanished the garment. Again he commanded, and the garment appeared. When the gods, his fathers, saw thus his word fulfilled, joyful were they and did homage, Marduk his king. On him conferred scepter and throne, gave him invincible arms to crush them that hate him. Now go and cut short the life of Tiamat. May the winds into a secret place carry her blood. The ruler of the gods they made him, the gods, his fathers, wished him success and glory in the way on which he went. He made ready a bow, prepared it for use, made ready a spear to be his weapon. He took the, seized it in his right hand, bow and quiver hung at his side. Lightning he fashioned, flashing before him, with glowing flame he filled its body, a net he prepared to seize Tiamat, guarded the four corners of the world that nothing of her should escape. On south and north, on east and west, he laid the net, his father Anu's gift. He fashioned the evil wind, the south blast, the tornado, the four and seven wind, the wind of destruction and woe, sent forth the seven winds which he had made, Tiamat's body to destroy, after him they followed. Then seized the Lord the thunderbolt, his mighty weapon, the irresistible chariot, the terrible he mounted. To it four horses he harnessed, pitiless, fiery, swift. Their teeth were full of venom covered with foam. On it mounted Marduk the mighty, in battle. To right and left he looked, lifting his eye. His terrible brightness surrounded his head. Against her he advanced, went on his way. To Tiamat lifted his face. They looked at him. At him looked the gods. The gods, his fathers, looked at him. At him looked the gods. And nearer pressed the Lord, with his eye piercing Tiamat. On Kingu her consort rested his look. As he so looked, every way is stopped. His senses Kingu loses, vanishes his thought, and the gods his helpers, who stood by his side, saw their leader powerless. But Tiamat stood, not turning her back. With fierce lips to him she spake. 
then grasped the Lord his thunderbolt, his mighty weapon. Angry at Tiamat, he hurled his words. When Tiamat heard these words, she fell into fury. Beside herself was she. Tiamat cried wild and loud, till through and through her body shook. She utters her magic formula, speaks her word, and the gods of battle rush to arms. Then advance Tiamat and Marduk, the ruler of the gods. To battle they rush. Come on to the fight. His wide stretched net over her the Lord did cast. The evil wind from behind him he let loose in her face. Tiamat opened her throat as wide as she might. Into it he sent the evil wind before she could close her lips. The terrible winds filled her body. Her senses she lost. Wide open stood her throat. He seized his spear. Through her body he ran it. Her inward parts he hewed. Cut to pieces her heart. Her he overcame. Put an end to her life. Cast away her corpse, and on it stood. So he, the leader, slew Tiamat. Her power he crushed, her might he destroyed. Then the gods, her helpers, who stood at her side. Fear and trembling seized them. Their backs they turned. Away they fled to save their lives. Fast were they girt. Escape they could not. Captive he took them. Broke in pieces their arms. They were caught in the net. Sat in the toils, all the earth they filled with their cry. Their doom they bore, held fast in prison, and the eleven creatures clothed with dread, a herd of demons who with her went. These he subdued, destroyed their power, crushed their valour, trod them underfoot. And Kingu, who had grown great over them all, him he overcame with the god Kuga took from him the tablets of fate which were not rightfully his, stamped there on his seal, and hung them on his breast. When thus the doughty Marduk had conquered his foes, his proud adversary to shame had brought, had completed Anshar's triumph over the enemy, had fulfilled Nudimud's will. Then the conquered gods he put in prison, and to Tiamat, whom he had conquered, returned. Under his foot the Lord Tiamat's body trod, with his irresistible club he shattered her skull. Through the veins of her blood he cut, commanded the north wind to bear it to a secret place. His father saw it, rejoiced and shouted. Gifts and offerings to him they brought. The Lord was appeased, seeing her corpse. Dividing her body, wise plans he laid. Into two halves like a fish he divided her. Out of one half he made the vault of heaven. A bar he set and guards he posted. Gave them command that the waters pass not through. Through the heaven he strode, viewed its spaces, near the deep place Nudimud's dwelling. And the Lord measured the domain of the deep, a palace like it Eshara he built, the palace Eshara which he fashioned as heaven. Therein he made Anu, Bel, and Ea to dwell. He established the station of the great gods, stars which were like them, constellations he set. The year he established marked off its parts divided twelve months by three stars. From the day that begins the year to the day that ends it, he established the station Nibir to mark its limits, that no harm come, no one go astray, the stations of Bel and Ear be set by its side. Great doors he made on this side and that, closed them fast on left and right. The moon god he summoned, to him committed the night. Here the account breaks off, there probably followed the history of the creation of the earth and of man. 3. Fragments of a Descent to the Underworld To the underworld I turn, I spread my wings like a bird. I descend to the house of darkness, to the dwelling of Urkala, to the house from which there is no exit, the road on which there is no return, to the house whose dwellers long for light, dust is their nourishment and mud their food whose chiefs are like feathered birds, where light is never seen, in darkness they dwell. In the house which I will enter, there is treasured up for me a crown, with the crowned ones who of old ruled the earth, to whom Anu and Bel have given terrible names. Carrion is their food, their drink stagnant water, there dwell the chiefs and unconquered ones, there dwell the bards and the mighty men. 
Monsters of the deep of the great gods. It is the dwelling of Etana, the dwelling of Ner, of Ninkigal, the queen of the underworld. Her I will approach, and she will see me. Ishtar's descent to the underworld. After a description substantially identical with the first half of the preceding poem, the story goes on. To the gate of the underworld Ishtar came. To the keeper of the gate her command she addressed. Keeper of the waters, open thy gate. Open thy gate that I may enter. If thou open not the gate and let me in, I will strike the door, the posts I will shatter. I will strike the hinges, burst open the doors. I will rise up the dead devourers of the living. Over the living the dead shall triumph. The keeper opened his mouth and spake. To the princess Ishtar he cried, Stay, lady, do not thus. Let me go and repeat thy words to Queen Ninkigal. He goes and gets the terrible queen's permission for Ishtar to enter on certain conditions. Through the first gate he caused her to pass. The crown of her head he took away. Why, O oh keeper, takest thou away the great crown of my head? Thus, O oh lady, the goddess of the underworld doeth to all her visitors at the entrance. Through the second gate he caused her to pass. The earrings of her ears he took away. Why, O oh keeper, takest thou away the earrings of my ears? So, O oh lady, the goddess of the underworld doeth to all that enter her realm. And so at each gate till she is stripped of clothing. A long time Ninkigal holds her prisoner, and in the upper world love vanishes, and men and gods mourn. Ea sees that Ishtar must return, and sends his messenger to bring her. Go forth, O oh messenger, toward the gates of the underworld set thy face. Let the seven gates of Hades be opened at thy presence. Let Ninkigal see thee, and rejoice at thy arrival. Let her heart be satisfied, and her anger be removed. Appease her by the names of the great gods. Ninkigal, when this she heard, beat her breast and wrung her hands. Turned away, no comfort would she take. Go, thou messenger. Let the great jailer keep thee. The refuse of the city be thy food. The drains of the city thy drink. The shadow of the dungeon be thy resting place. The slab of stone be thy seat. Ninkigal opened her mouth and spake. To Simtar, her attendant, her command she gave. Go, Simtar, strike the palace of judgment. Pour over Ishtar the water of life, and bring her before me. Simtar went and struck the palace of judgment. On Ishtar he poured the water of life and brought her. Through the first gate he caused her to pass, and restored to her her covering cloak. And so through the seven gates till all her ornaments are restored. The result of the visit to the underworld is not described. 4. The Flood The hero, Gilgamesh, Isdabar, wandering in search of healing for his sickness, finds Hasisadra, Sithuthros, the Babylonian Noah, who tells him the story of the flood. Hasisadra spake to him, to Gilgamesh, To thee I will reveal, Gilgamesh, the story of my deliverance, and the oracle of the gods I will make known to thee. The city of Siripak, which, as thou knowest, lies on the Euphrates bank. Already old was this city, when the gods that therein dwell to send a flood their heart impelled them. All the great gods, their father Anu, their counsellor the warlike Bel, Adar their throne-bearer, and the prince Anuji. The lord of boundless wisdom, Ea, sat with them in council. Their resolve he announced, and so he spake. O thou of Suripak, son of Ubaratutu, leave thy house and build a ship. They will destroy the seed of life. Do thou preserve in life, and hither bring the seed of life of every sort into the ship. Here follows a statement of the dimensions of the ship, but the numbers are lost. When this I heard, to ear my lord I spake, The building of the ship, O lord, which thou commandest, If I perform it, people and elders will mock me. Ear opened his mouth and spake, spake to me his servant. The text here is mutilated. Hasisadra is ordered to threaten the mockers with Ea's vengeance. Thou, however, shut not thy door till I send thee word. Then pass through the door and bring all grain and goods and wealth, family, servants and maids and all thy kin, the cattle of the field, the beasts of the field. Hasisadra opened his mouth. To Ea his lord he said, O oh my lord, a ship in this wise hath no one ever built. 
Hasisadra tells how he built a ship according to Ea's directions. All that I had I brought together, all of silver and all of gold, and all of the seed of life into the ship I brought, and my household, men and women, the cattle of the field, the beasts of the field, and all my kin I caused to enter. Then when the sun was destined, time brought on. To me, he said at evenfall, destruction shall the heaven reign. Enter the ship and close the door. With sorrow on that day I saw the sun go down. The day on which I was to enter the ship I was afraid. Yet into the ship I went. Behind me the door I closed. Into the hands of the steersman I gave the ship with its cargo. Then from the heaven's horizon rose the dark cloud. Raman uttered his thunder. Nabu and Saru rushed on. Over the hill and dale strode the throne bearers. Adar sent ceaseless streams. Floods the Anunnaki brought. Their power shakes the earth. Raman's billows up to heaven mount. All light to darkness is turned. Brother looks not after brother. No man for another cares. The gods in heaven are frightened. Refuge they seek. Upward they mount to the heaven of Anu, like a dog in his lair. So cower the gods together at the bars of heaven. Ishtar cries out in pain. Loud cries the exalted goddess. All is turned to mire. This evil to the gods I announced. To the gods foretold the evil. This exterminating war foretold. Against my race of mankind. Not for this bear I men that like the brood of the fishes. They should fill the sea. Then wept the gods with her over the Anunnaki. In lamentation sat the gods, their lips hard pressed together. Six days and seven nights ruled wind and flood and storm. But when the seventh day broke, subsided the storm and the flood, which raged like a mighty host, settled itself to quiet. Down went the sea, ceased storm and flood. Through the sea I rode lamenting. The upper dwellings of men were ruined. Corpses floated like trees. A window I opened. On my face the daylight fell. I shuddered and sat me down weeping. Over my face flowed my tears. I rode over regions of land on a terrible sea. Then rose one piece of land twelve measures high. To the land Nazir the ship was steered. The mountain Nazir held the ship fast and let it no more go. At the dawn of the seventh day, I took a dove and sent it forth. Hither and thither flew the dove. No resting place it found. Back to me it came. A swallow I took and set it forth. No resting place it found, and back to me it came. A raven I took and sent it forth. Forth flew the raven and saw that the water had fallen. Carefully waded on, but came not back. All the animals then to the four winds I sent. A sacrifice I offered, an altar I built on the mountain top. By sevens I placed the vessels. Under them spread sweet cane and cedar. The gods inhaled the smoke. Inhaled the sweet-smelling smoke. Like flies the gods collected over the offering. Thither then came Ishtar. Lifted on high her bow, which Anu had made. These days I will not forget. Will keep them in remembrance. Them I will never forget. Let the gods come to the altar. But let not Bel to the altar come. Because he heedlessly wrought the flood he brought on. To destruction my people gave over. Thither came Bel and saw the ship. Full of anger was he against the gods and the spirits of heaven. What soul has escaped? In the destruction no man shall live. Then Adar opened his mouth and spake, spake to the warlike bell. Who but Ea knew it? He knew, and all he hath told. Then Ea opened his mouth, spake to the warlike bell. Thou art the valiant leader of the gods. Why hast thou heedlessly wrought and brought on the flood? Let the sinner bear his sin the wrongdoer his wrong. Yield to our request that he be not wholly destroyed. Instead of sending a flood, send lions that men be reduced. Instead of sending a flood, send hyenas that men be reduced. Instead of sending a flood, send flames to waste the land. Instead of sending a flood, send pestilence that men be reduced. The counsel of the great gods to him I did not impart. A dream to Hasisadra I sent, and the will of the gods he learned. Then came right reason to Bell. Into the ship he entered, took my hand and lifted me up, raised my wife and laid her hand in mine. To us he turned, between us he stepped. 
his blessing he gave. Human Hasisadra has been, but he and his wife united, now to the gods shall be raised, and Hasisadra shall dwell far off at the mouth of the streams. Then they took me and placed me far off at the mouth of the streams. 5. The Eagle and the Snake To Samas came the snake and said, The eagle has come to my nest, my younger scattered. See, O Samas, what evil he has done me. Help me, thy nest is as broad as the earth, thy snare is like the heavens. Who can escape out of thy net? Hearing the snake's complaint, Samas opened his mouth and spake, Get thee on thy way, go to the mountain. A wild ox shall be thy hiding place. Open his body, tear out his inward parts. Make thy dwelling within him. All the birds of heaven will descend. With them will come the eagle. Heedless and hurrying on the flesh, he will swoop, thinking of that which is hidden inside. So soon as he enters the ox, seize his wing. Tear off his wing feathers and claws. Pull him to pieces and cast him away. Let him die of hunger and thirst. So as the mighty Samas commanded, rose the snake, went to the mountain. There he found a wild ox, opened his body, tore out his inward parts, entered and dwelt within him. And the birds of heaven descended, with them came the eagle. Yet the eagle, fearing a snare, ate not of the flesh with the birds. The eagle spake to his young, We will not fly down, nor eat the flesh of the wild ox. An eaglet, keen of eye, thus to his father spake, in the flesh of the ox lurks the snake. The rest is lost. 6. The Flight of Etana The priests have offered my sacrifice, with joyful hearts to the gods. O Lord, issue thy command. Give me the plant of birth. Show me the plant of birth. Bring the child into the world. Grant me a son. Samas opened his mouth and spake to Etana. Away with thee. Go to the mountain. The eagle opened his mouth and spake to Etana. Wherefore art thou come? Etana opened his mouth and said to the eagle, My friend, give me the plant of birth. Show me the plant of birth. Bring the child into the world. Grant me a son. To Etana then spake the eagle, My friend, be of good cheer. Come, let me bear thee to Anu's heaven. On my breast, lay thy breast. Grasp with thy hands the feathers of my wings. On my side lay thy side. On his breast he laid his breast. On his feathers he placed his hands. On his side he laid his side. Firmly he clung, great was his weight. Two hours he bore him on high. The eagle spake to him, to Etana. See, my friend, the land, how it lies. Look at the sea, the ocean girded. Like a mountain looks the land. The sea like petty waters. Two hours more he bore him up. The eagle spake to him, to Etana. See, my friend, the land, how it lies. The sea is like the girdle of the land. Two hours more he bore him up. The eagle spake to him, to Etana. See, my friend, the land, how it lies. The sea is like the gardener's ditches. Up they rose to Anu's heaven, came to the gate of Anu, Bell, and Ear. Come, my friend, let me bear thee to Ishtar. To Ishtar the queen shalt thou go, and dwell at her feet. On my side lay thy side. Grasp my wing feathers with thy hands. On his side he laid his side. His feathers he grasped with his hands. Two hours he bore him on high. My friend, see the land, how it lies, how it spreads itself out. The broad sea is as great as a court. Two hours he bore him on high. My friend, see the land, how it lies. The land is like the bed of a garden. The broad sea is as great as a... Two hours he bore him on high. My friend, see the land, how it lies. Etana, frightened, begs the eagle to ascend no further. Then, as it seems, the bird's strength is exhausted. To the earth the eagle fell down, shattered upon the ground. End of section 6. Recording by Lucy Perry, in Bath, on February 21st, 2010. Section 7 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 7. Excerpts of Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian Literature. Translated by Crawford H. Toy. 7. The God Zoo. He sees the badges of rule, his royal crown, his raiment divine. On the tablets of fate of the gods, Zoo fixes his look. On the father of the gods, the god of Duranki, Zoo fixes his gaze. Lust after rule enters into his soul. I will take the tablets of fate of the gods, will determine the oracle of all the gods, will set up my throne, all orders control, will rule all the heavenly spirits. His heart was set on combat. At the entrance of the hall he stands, waiting the break of day, when Bell dispensed the tender reins, sat on his throne, put off his crown. He snatched the tablets of fate from his hands, seized the power, the control of commands. Down flew Zu, in a mountain he hid. There was anguish and crying. On the earth Bell poured out his wrath. Anu opened his mouth and spake, said to the gods, his children, Who will conquer Zu? Great shall be his name among the dwellers of all lands. They call for Raman, the mighty, Anu's son. To him gives Anu command. Up, Raman, my son, thou hero. From thine attack desist not, conquer Zu with thy weapons, that thy name may be great in the assembly of the great gods. Among the gods thy brethren, none shall be thy equal. Thy shrines on high shall be built. Found these cities in all the world. Thy cities shall reach to the mountain of the world. Show thyself strong for the gods, strong be thy name. To Anu his father's command, Raman answered and spake, My father, who shall come to the inaccessible mound? Who is like unto Zu among the gods thy sons? The tablets of fate he has snatched from his hands, seized on the power, the control of commands. Zu has fled and hides in his mountain. The rest is lost. 8. Adapa and the South Wind Under the water the south wind blew him, sunk him to the home of the fishes. O south wind, ill hast thou used me, thy wings I will break. As thus with his mouth he spake, the wings of the south wind were broken. Seven days long the south wind over the earth blew no more. To his messenger, Illa Abrat, Anu then spake thus, Why for seven days long blows the south wind no more on the earth? His messenger, Illa Abrat, answered and said, My lord Adapa, Ea's son, hath broken the wings of the south wind. When Anu heard these words, Aha! he cried, and went forth. Ea, the ocean god, then directs his son how to proceed in order to avert Anu's wrath. Some lines are mutilated. At the gate of Anu stand. The gods Tammuz and Isida will see thee and ask, Why lookest thou thus, Adapa? For whom wearest thou garments of mourning? From the earth two gods have vanished, therefore do I thus. Who are these two gods, who from the earth have vanished? At each other they will look, Tammuz and Isida, and lament. A friendly word they will speak to Anu. Anu's sacred face they will show thee. When thou to Anu comest, food of death will be offered thee, eat not thereof. Water of death will be offered thee, drink not thereof. A garment will be offered thee, put it on. Oil will be offered thee, anoint thyself therewith. What I tell thee neglect not, keep my word in mind. Then came Anu's messenger. The wing of the south wind Adapa has broken, deliver him up to me. Up to the heaven he came, approach the gate of Anu. At Anu's gate Tammuz and Izzida stand. Adapa they see, and, aha, they cry. O Adapa, wherefore lookest thou thus? For whom wearest thou apparel of mourning? From the earth two gods have vanished, therefore I wear apparel of mourning. Who are these two gods who from the earth have vanished? At one another look Tammuz and Izzida, and lament. Adapa go hence to Anu. When he came, Anu at him looked, saying, O Adapa, 
Why hast thou broken the south wind's wing? Adapa answered, My lord, for my lord's house I was fishing. In the midst of the sea it was smooth. Then the south wind began to blow. Under it forced me, to the home of the fishes I sank. By this speech Anu's anger is turned away. A beaker he set before him. What shall we offer him? Food of life. Prepare for him that he may eat. Food of life was brought for him, but he ate not. Water of life was brought for him, but he drank not. A garment was brought him, he put it on. Oil they gave him, he anointed himself therewith. Anu looked at him and mourned. And now, Adapa, wherefore hast thou not eaten nor drunken? Now canst thou not live for ever? Ea, my lord, commanded me, thou shalt not eat nor drink. 9. Penitential Psalms 1. The Suppliant I, thy servant, full of sin, cry to thee. The sinner's earnest prayer thou dost accept. The man on whom thou lookest lives, mistress of all, queen of mankind, merciful one to whom it is good to turn, who acceptest the sigh of the heart. The Priest Because his God and his goddess are angry, he cries to thee. To him turn thy face, take his hand. The Suppliant Beside thee there is no God to guide me. Look in mercy on me, accept my sigh. Say why do I wait so long? Let thy face be softened. How long, O oh my lady, may thy kindness be turned to me. Like a dove I mourn, full of sighing. The Priest With sorrow and woe his soul is full of sighing. Tears he sheds, he pours out laments. 2. O mother of the gods, who performest the commands of Bel, who makest the young grass sprout, queen of mankind, creator of all, guide of every birth, mother Ishtar, whose might no god approaches. Exalted mistress, mighty in command, a prayer I will utter, let her do what seems her good. O my lady, make me to know my doing. Food I have not eaten, weeping was my nourishment, water I have not drunk, tears were my drink, my heart has not been joyful, nor my spirits glad. Many are my sins, sorrowful my soul. O my lady, make me to know my doing, make me a place of rest, cleanse my sin, lift up my face. May my God, the Lord of prayer, before thee set my prayer. May my goddess, the lady of supplication, before thee set my supplication. May the storm god set my prayer before thee. The intercession of a number of gods is here invoked. Let thy eye rest graciously on me. Turn thy face graciously to me. Let thy heart be gentle, thy spirit mild. 3. O lady, in sorrow of heart, sore oppressed I cry to thee. O lady, to thy servant favour show. Let thy heart be favourable. To thy servant full of sorrow show thy pity. Turn to him thy face, accept his prayer. 4. To thy servant, with whom thou art angry, graciously turn. May the anger of my lord be appeased. Appease the god I know not. The goddess I know. The goddess I know not. The god who is angry with me. The goddess who is angry with me be appeased. The sin which I have committed I know not. May my god name a gracious name. My goddess name a gracious name. The god I know. The god I know not. Name a gracious name. The goddess I know. The goddess I know not. Name a gracious name. Pure food I have not eaten. Pure water I have not drunk. The wrath of my God, though I knew it not, was my food. The anger of my goddess, though I knew it not, cast me down. O Lord, many are my sins, great my misdeeds. These phrases are repeated many times. The Lord has looked on me in anger. The God has punished me in wrath. The goddess was angry with me, and hath brought me to sorrow. I sought for help, but no one took my hand. I wept, but no one to me came. I cry aloud, there is none that hears me. Sorrowful I lie on the ground, look not up. To my merciful God I turn, I sigh aloud. The feet of my goddess I kiss. To the known and unknown God I loud do sigh. 
To the known and unknown goddess I loud do sigh. O Lord, look on me, hear my prayer. O goddess, look on me, hear my prayer. Men are perverse, nothing they know. Men of every name, what do they know? Do they good or ill, nothing they know. O Lord, cast not down thy servant, him plunged into the flood, seized by the hand. The sin I have committed turn thou to favour, the evil I have done may the wind carry it away, tear in pieces my wrongdoings like a garment. My God, my sins are seven times seven, forgive my sins. My Goddess, my sins are seven times seven, forgive my sins. Known and unknown God, my sins are seven times seven, forgive my sins. Known and unknown goddess, my sins are seven times seven. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins, and I will humbly bow before thee. 5. May the Lord, the mighty ruler Adar, announce my prayer to thee. May the suppliant Lady Nippur announce my prayer to thee. May the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord of Eridu, announce my prayer to thee. The mother of the great house, the goddess Damkina, Announce my prayer to thee. May Marduk, the lord of Babylon, announce my prayer to thee. May his consort, the exalted child of heaven and earth, announce my prayer to thee. May the exalted minister, the god who names the good name, announce my prayer to thee. May the bride, the firstborn of the god, announce my prayer to thee. May the god of storm flood, the lord Hosaga, announce my prayer to thee. May the gracious lady of the land announce my prayer to thee. 10. Inscription of Sennacherib Taylor Cylinder, B.C. 701, C.F. 2 Kings, 1819 Sennacherib, the great king, the powerful king, the king of the world, the king of Assyria, the king of the four zones, the wise shepherd, the favourite of the great gods, the protector of justice, the lover of righteousness, the giver of help, the aider of the weak, the perfect hero, the stalwart warrior, the first of princes, the destroyer of the rebellious, the destroyer of enemies. Assur, the mighty rock, a kingdom without rival has granted me. Over all who sit on sacred seats, he has exalted my arms. From the upper sea of the setting sun, to the lower sea of the rising sun, all the black-headed people he has cast beneath my feet. The rebellious princes shun battle with me. They forsook their dwellings, like a falcon, which dwells in the clefts, they fled alone to an inaccessible place. To the city of Ekron I went, the governors and princes who had done evil I slew. I bound their corpses to poles around the city. The inhabitants of the city who had done evil I reckoned as spoil. To the rest who had done no wrong I spoke peace. Paddy, their king, I brought from Jerusalem. King over them I made him. The tribute of my lordship I laid upon him. Hezekiah of Judah, who had not submitted to me, forty-six of his strong cities, small cities without number, I besieged, casting down the walls, advancing engines, by assault I took them, two hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty men and women, young and old, horses, mules, asses, camels, oxen, sheep, I brought out and reckoned as spoil. Hezekiah himself I shut up like a caged bird, in Jerusalem, his royal city. The walls I fortified against him. Whoever came out of the gates, I turned him back. His cities which I had plundered, I divided from his land, and gave them to Mitinti, king of Ashdod, to Padi, king of Ekron, and to Silbal, king of Gaza. To the former tribute paid yearly, I added the tribute of alliance of my lordship, and laid that upon him. Hezekiah himself was overwhelmed by the fear of the brightness of my lordship. The Arabians and his other faithful warriors, whom, for the defence of Jerusalem, his royal city, he had brought in, fell into fear. With thirty talents of gold, and eight hundred talents of silver, precious stones, couches of ivory, thrones of ivory, and his daughters, his women of the palace. The young men and the young women, to Nineveh, the city of my lordship, I caused to be brought after me, and he sent his ambassadors to give tribute, and to pay homage. 11. Invocation to the Goddess Beltis To Beltis, the great lady, 
chief of heaven and earth, queen of all the gods, mighty in all the lands. Honoured is her festival among the Ishtars. She surpasses her offspring in power. She, the shining one, like her brother the sun, enlightens heaven and earth. Mistress of the spirits, of the underworld, firstborn of Anu, great among the gods, ruler over her enemies, the seas she stirs up, the wooded mountains tramples underfoot, mistress of the spirits of upper air, goddess of battle and fight, without whom the heavenly temple none would render obedience. She, the bestower of strength, grants the desire of the faithful, prayers she hears, supplication receives, entreaty accepts. Ishtar, the perfect light, all-powerful, who enlightens heaven and earth, her name is proclaimed throughout all the lands. Isa Haddon, king of lands, fear not, to her it is good to pray. 12. Oracles of Ishtar of Arbila B.C. 680-668 to 668. Isa Haddon, king of lands, fear not, the Lord, the Spirit who speaks to thee, I speak to him. I have not kept it back. Thine enemies, like the floods of Sivan, before thee flee perpetually. I, the great goddess, Ishtar of Arbila, have put thine enemies to flight. Where are the words I spake to thee? Thou hast not trusted them. I, Ishtar of Arbila, thy foes, into thy hands I give. In the van and by thy side I go, fear not. In the midst of thy princes thou art, in the midst of my host I advance and rest. O Isa Haddon, fear not. Sixty great gods are with me to guard thee. The moon god on thy right, the sun god on thy left. Around thee stand the sixty great gods, and make the centre firm. Trust not to man, look thou to me. Honour me, and fear not. To Isa Haddon, my king, long days and length of years I give. Thy throne beneath the heavens I have established. In a golden dwelling thee I will guard in heaven. Guard like the diadem of my head. The former word which I spake thou didst not trust. But trust thou now this later word, and glorify me. When the day dawns bright, complete thy sacrifice. Pure food thou shalt eat, pure waters drink. In thy palace thou shalt be pure. Thy son, thy son's son the kingdom, by the blessing of Nergal, shall rule. 13. An Erechite's Lament how long, O my lady, shall the strong enemy hold thy sanctuary? There is want in Erech, thy principal city. Blood is flowing like water in Eelbar, the house of thy oracle. He has kindled and poured out fire like hailstones on all thy lands. My lady, sorely am I fettered by misfortune. My lady, thou hast surrounded me and brought me to grief. The mighty enemy has smitten me down like a single reed. Not wise myself, I cannot take counsel. I mourn day and night like the fields. I, thy servant, pray to thee. Let thy heart take rest. Let thy disposition be softened. End of section 7 Recording by Lucy Perry in Bath on July 2nd, 2010